wanted to try to write history forward. Most history is written backward. People know uh, what happened. And the idea of this trilogy uh, of books on Kennedy, on Nixon, and on Reagan uh, was to present the world and present their lives uh, as they knew it at the time. What did they, what did they know? And what was it like to be president of the United States, to be the most powerful man uh, in the world, uh, and to live this sui generis uh, life? I decided that I should take on Ronald Reagan, who I knew, though I disagreed with him on most things, was uh, the most successful of those three presidents, and the most interesting. Uh, in many ways. And I found in, in the years that I, I spent with him, as it were, either with his papers or interviewing people or uh, going through all of the reconstruction of his days, uh, that most of the things that I knew or thought about Reagan turned out not to be true. In fact, I concluded, I don't know what effect this will have, the, uh, the truth was almost always the exact opposite of what uh, we knew about Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, the passive, who has been, there are 900 books about Ronald Reagan. Uh, a lot of them talk about his passivity. The most aggressive political act you can take in our system is to run against an incumbent president of your own party. Uh, Ronald Reagan did that in 1976, and he damn near pulled it off, too. He lost to Gerald Ford at the Republican convention. The vote uh, in that convention by delegates was 1,187 to 1,070. Uh, Ronald Reagan, the lazy. Ronald Reagan talked to more members of Congress in his first 30 days in office than Jimmy Carter talked to in his entire four years. He won over, essentially, the conservative wing of the Democratic Party, one-on-one, -on -one, uh, which was what gave him the power to, uh, to govern uh, as well as he did. Ronald Reagan, the, the manipulated, uh, no one ever manipulated Ronald Reagan. Uh, Don Regan, I was the lead of the, the review of this book, in the Washington Post was a conversation I had with, with Don Regan when I asked him uh, what, what was the, uh, the greatest problem in the White House when you were chief of staff. And he said that uh, everyone in the White House thought they were smarter than the president. I said, including you? He said, especially me. Uh, <clears throat> Ronald Reagan was a stubborn old man. I could, I don't, the greatest difference between Ronald Reagan and Kennedy and Nixon uh, was not ideology, but it was age. Uh, Ronald Reagan had learned all he wanted to learn uh, in this life, and he didn't much care about what people said about him. When he talked about history, he talked to Ed Rollins, uh, who was his political director for a time, was, uh, uh, was the chairman of the 19th. 84 re-election effort, and he said something about history, and Ronald Reagan said, why the hell should I care about history? Uh, they're going to get it wrong, and I'm going to be dead. Uh, the, he, had, he, he had his own pretty simple uh, ideology. However, he is the only president of the United States who became a noun. There's Jeffersonian, Lincolnian, Rooseveltian, but there's only one Reaganism. Only one president ever created an ideology which happens to continue to be running the country. Reagan, as far as I can tell, is still the president, as Roosevelt still was the president for years uh, after he died. After the 1976 challenge to Ford, uh, the elders of the party uh, decided that they had to do something. They had this ignorant governor of California, this cowboy actor, and they had to brief him on, uh, on what it was like to be president because they thought their fate was tied to, them, to him and they were quite right. And Richard Allen uh, gave him the, his briefings on the Soviet Union and the Cold War. And he, he kept trying to make the point is, people are afraid of you and you have to come out 
uh, with a strategy that shows how you're going to deal with the Soviet Union and deal with the Cold War. They talked for four hours. Alan did most of the talking. Uh, and as they were leaving, Reagan said he appreciated uh, the time and the effort that uh, Alan had put in. He said, but he said, I don't want you to go out of here thinking I don't have a strategy. You may not consider it a strategy, but here's my strategy. We win, they lose. <laughs> Uh, in terms of Richard Allen, who became his first national security advisor, uh, and all the rest of them, as James Baker said, the people who were supposedly manipulating him, uh, he said, Ronald Reagan said, Jim Baker is a very democratic fellow. He treats us all the same, like hired help. The people who were supposedly admitting him, the fellows, uh, he didn't even know their names. And they were as interchangeable as cameramen were uh, on the lot when he was an actor. Uh, and the, the subtitle of this book, actually, I wanted a subtitle for a while, but the publisher talked me out of it very quickly, which was, all my books are, are uh, uh, President Nixon alone in the White House. Uh, I said, why don't we call it uh, President Reagan, based on a true story? <laughs> uh, <coughs> They were not amused. They were amused. They laughed at first, but uh, they were not amused for a long uh, time. We, I settled on a, a, a triumph of imagination because R Ronald Reagan's powers as a politician and as a public person were such that he imagined an American past, which had a lot to do with the Reader's Digest and, uh, and living on the Mississippi and, to and uh, Tom Sawyer, and he made people believe it, that that was uh, the shining city on a hill. He had imagined a lot of it, most of it, uh, but he got people to believe. Then he imagined a world, a future, and he made a hell of a lot of it happen. He was one of the most extraordinary political leaders of all time. I met Ronald Reagan first uh, in 1967 at the uh, uh, Biltmore Hotel in Los Angeles. I was then the uh, City Hall Bureau Chief of the New York Times, uh, and there was great talk in, at that time, 19, late 1967, of a Republican dream ticket of Rockefeller and Reagan uh, with the Eastern Liberal and, uh, and this new hero of Western conservatives. And so uh, Reagan, uh, Lynn, uh, Rockefeller did not want to deal directly with Reagan, but he had Lindsay go out uh, to talk to him. Lindsay, in his own mind, had a dream ticket, which was Reagan Lindsay. But uh, we, so we walked down the hall, and uh, the two of us, John Lindsay and I, and Lindsay raises his hand to knock on the door of the presidential suite at the Biltmore. But before his hand hits the door, the door pops open. And there's Ronald Reagan. Uh, and he had obviously been looking through the people to see it coming. And he said, uh, Mr. Mayor, I've always wanted to ask, it was obviously rehearsed, Mr. Mayor, I've always wanted to ask a real New Yorker a question. Uh, have you ever been to the top of the Empire State Building? <laughs> and I thought, this is a pretty goofy guy. Because uh, that's what we all thought of him uh, in those days. In 1975, I wrote a book uh, on Gerald Ford called The Ford, Not a Lincoln. Uh, and uh, I, there are parts of that book I should apologize for, but uh, I then went, I, and I then did the book promotion like this uh, and was on. All, there were all night, it was the beginning of all night radio question shows. And I was stunned traveling the country that in all these shows, people were, uh, were attacking Washington, were attacking the government. And I came back, I was then, I was one of the founders of New York Magazine. And uh, I wrote a piece saying that I thought the next president of the United States would be or would be either Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter was anti-Washington, Ronald Reagan was anti-government, and the country was clearly uh, there. And when I wrote that, uh, Reagan wrote me a, a letter, and uh, I, thank, I think he was thanking me, but 
uh, and he said, we should get together, I'm sure we'll agree on a number of things. Well, over the years we did get together and we did agree on two things at least which were very important. Uh, one was Amer what historians call American exceptionalism, uh, which I believed, uh, I believe in, and I uh, believe that our, our experience as a nation quite different than most others, uh, and that makes us different. He believed in that, but he, th he felt that made us better. He believed simply that Americans were better than other people, and that other people wanted to be just like us, and uh, if they didn't, we'd get them. Uh, the, but we also agreed about communism and the Soviet Union. I had spent time in the Soviet Union beginning in the early 1970s, and the first time I saw, I, I, like many people, I wasn't there 15 minutes when I realized we were being lied to on a very high level uh, in the, the idea that these people were going to beat us at anything. Uh, I thought from, from those days on uh, was ludicrous. Uh, Reagan had never been in the Soviet Union, he'd never been any place. I saw, I, I was, we lived part time in Paris, and uh, I met uh, Pierre Salinger's, uh, at New York, on New Year's, uh, saw Pierre Salinger's widow, one of his widows, and uh, Nicole Warner, she's known in Paris. But she wanted to tell me the story that uh, Ronald Reagan had told her when she was in Washington once at a dinner for, for Charlton Heston, actually. And it was this charming story of Reagan as a young man waiting in line at customs and this stone-faced uh, French uh, customs guard opening baggage and holding up uh, uh, brassiers and things like that and saying, C'est uh, bon, uh, n'est-ce pas, and uh, it was wonderful story. And she said, I just wanted to tell you that because I said, you know, that never happened. She said, what do you mean it never happened? He, I said, the man was never in France. Uh, <laughs> there may be a movie somewhere with that scene in it, but at that, before he was president, Ronald Reagan had never uh, been in France. He hadn't flown in a plane for 25 years. Uh, the, uh, he did a lot of terrible things, did this fellow, talented fellow. Uh, the opportunity, we'll never know the opportunity costs of the Reagan administration. Part of it, I would think, uh, is, is national health care. But the, the thing that he did, uh, like, Reagan, uh, like Nixon eliminating the draft, Ronald Reagan dumbed down America. Uh, and maybe, maybe the world too. The blurring of fact and fiction, the blurring of entertainment and reality uh, was his gift. He could, he could translate events uh, into anything that he wanted them to be. One of the things about him was he understood, my wife always says, don't tell people this, Ronald Reagan understood that words are more important than deeds. Uh, in leadership. Ronald Reagan understood that being President of the United States is not about managing the government, it's about leading uh, the nation. Uh, and he was unscrupulous, uh, particularly, we'll, we don't know yet what the other, what else we've lost, because we don't know yet, even 25 years after he was inaugurated, what will be the effect of the deficits uh, that he built in uh, to the budget, and as Dick Cheney said at the beginning of the Iraq War, we don't have to worry about the money. Ronald Reagan proved deficits don't count. Well, with luck, they don't. Uh, but the, the man who spent his entire career attacking tax and spend Democrats was basically a spend and borrow Republican, and we now, that's been institutionalized uh, within conservative uh, governance. Uh, Having said what was wrong with them, and there was a lot wrong with them in the, in the future of uh, democracy, we, the press, almost totally misunderstood uh, the way uh, the man operated. And uh, one example is Ronald Reagan used to fall asleep in public, he used to fall asleep in private. I, I came to the conclusion that naps are not a, a threat to national security. But his most famous nap was when he was talking to the Pope. And the press reported that. It was on every tele, it still runs on television, of him dozing off as John Paul uh, was talking. But what the press didn't know was that inside the Vatican, before he came out and took his nap in public, the Pope and Ronald Reagan were crawling around on the floor of the, of the Pope's uh, sitting room using American satellite 
maps to locate missile locations on both sides uh, of the Iron Curtain. And it was from that exercise that the Pope privately assured Reagan he would not support the nuclear freeze. If the Pope had supported the nuclear freeze uh, movement, which was sweeping Europe uh, at that time, uh, history would have been changed. Ronald Reagan persuaded him not to do that. Ronald Reagan was big on persuasion. The, he gave, at his last meeting with, uh, last meeting as president, uh, next to last meeting as president with, with Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, Reagan, it's one of the great scenes, Reagan gave him a video of Friendly Persuasion, the movie, and explained the plot to him up to a certain point, but then said, I won't tell you the rest, I don't want to ruin it for you, but you'll like it. Uh, and so that we've got this, this amazing man who had what amounted to a six-year script for an eight-year presidency. At the end of Reagan's six-year, with Iran-Contra uh, having happened and his approval ratings being as low as George uh, Bush's are now, he, was, he had really been totally abandoned by his own constituency uh, by then because they thought he was a doddering old fool who was selling out uh, the country uh, to the Russians and to this energetic uh, Russian leader. It was, and it was an extraordinary arc to, to, their, uh, to their relationship. And my book is the first to have the transcripts of the, of the Reagan and Gorbachev uh, conversations in their summit meetings, which is some of the most extraordinary reading about both men, about what one man trying to save his presidency, one man trying to save his country, and only they understanding uh, what they were talking about. There came a, a night, it was December 8th of 1987, uh, when Gorbachev was in Washington. It was the day that Gorbachev stopped on Connecticut Avenue and people uh, rushed up to him. He was coming down Connecticut Avenue with Vice President Bush. He'd had uh, breakfast with him and Bush said, gee, it's too bad you don't have time to see the people and what they're, and it was a Russian limousine and Gorbachev said, stop the car and he jumped out of Connecticut and L Street in Washington and plunged into the crowd, Secret Service going nuts, the KG people going even nuttier. Duke Zebert, who had the biggest restaurant in Washington at that time, sees it happening, comes on the balcony of his restaurant and keeps saying, Mr. General Secretary, Mr. General Secretary, we have borscht, we have borscht. Uh, Reagan, is, Reagan is seeing all this on television saying, you son of a bitch, wait till I get to uh, Moscow and see what I do. Uh, after that night was the state dinner, which Van Cliburn, who had, if you remember, made his reputation in the Soviet Union, not here, winning the Tchaikovsky competition, uh, played Moscow nights, and the Gorbachevs jumped up and began to sing. Everybody jumped up and began to sing. Uh, the day after that, George Will, who was Reagan's best friend and often worked for him uh, in the press, wrote that December 8, 1987, uh, will be remembered longer than December 7, 1941, because December 8, 1987, uh, will be remembered as the day the, the, the United States lost the Cold War because of this useful idiot who is president. Well, it happened to be the day we won the Cold War. Uh, and those, uh, those last uh, two years in the conversation uh, conversations between Reagan and Gorbachev. I think Washington Post said they were worth the price of admission, and I tended to agree. I was just staggered when I saw them. But whatever we think of Ronald Reagan, and I think both good and bad of him at different times, uh, 12 years after he became President of the United States, uh, Russia applied for membership in NATO. Thank you. When he was the president, we know later he had uh, suffered tremendously from Alzheimer's. Was there any indication of that while he was actually in the White House? Uh, I'm glad the, the he had, uh, I, I've worked a little bit with uh, David Owen, who was the foreign minister uh, of Great Britain, but is also a physician, uh, who's uh, finishing a book on leadership and illness. And 
he had done a good deal of work on this and whatnot. Reagan had uh, early dementia in the White House, and there are startling scenes of which uh, he's obviously totally out of it. Uh, but there are two things I, I want to say about that. One is dementia uh, is not Alzheimer's. I mean, dementia is something that happens to all of us uh, when we're looking for our keys. Uh, and, uh, and Alzheimer's is a terminal uh, disease. So, but he did not have Alzheimer's uh, when he was in the White House, but he did have dementia. But he was an old man, and he had learned he paid attention only to what he was interested in. And he was interested in the size of the government. He was interested in communism. He was interested in reducing taxes. And he was inter interested in convincing us that we are the greatest people uh, in the history of the planet. And then God put us here so that other people would have a worthy example to look up to. The best descriptions that I've seen of, of Reagan in action are by the Russian interpreters, Soviet interpreters, during the uh, uh, during the summit meetings with Gorbachev, and one of them, in in pretty literary style, described uh, Reagan as an old lion who was lying asleep and opened an eye, and there was an antelope walking on the horizon, and he rolls over and goes back to sleep. And then in a while he opens his eyes again, and the antelope is about 10, 15 feet away, and he rolls back. And then he opens his eyes again, and the antelope is right there, and he roars to fill the sky, and the antelope is no more. That was a Russian description of his negotiating style. Um, it was Ronald Reagan a conservative in what we, we think of as the historical context, or did he create his own conservatism? I think both things are probably true. He was a, uh, uh, he was a traditionalist, he was uh, a conservative, but he added things to his conservatism uh, as they suited his purpose. And he also understood uh, some things. Uh, he came out, Reagan kept his mouth shut, for instance, uh, on abortion for the first five years uh, of, I may have the five years wrong, but for the first part of his presidency, until he saw the film Silent Screen, basically Silent Scream, basically when the sonogram was invented. And he knew the power of imagery, et cetera. Ronald Reagan never gave bad news on camera ever because he knew those pictures would uh, 241 Marines uh, killed in Beirut because of his stupidity uh, in saying that their mission was not peacekeeping but was in training the Lebanese army which meant the Christians and our men are surrounded at the airport by Shiite Muslims uh, 241 of them uh, are killed that was all done on paper. Whenever there was bad news, someone else announced uh, the news because he knew the value. The, thing, the problem with television, if you're a public figure, is it runs forever. They can run that forever. But when he saw Silent Scream, if you remember that, and I'm sure most people here do, and he saw what a sonogram could show, he immediately went public on abortion because he knew that, the, that those pictures would change the debate, and indeed they have. Um, for his uh, appearance or image of having a lot of bravado militarily, I think your conclusion is he was actually very conservative, part of which was proven by what happened in Beirut, but also share with us uh, what he did with reference to Grenada. The, uh, uh, Reagan, unlike certain people, uh, understood the situation once, the, once these uh, our people had uh, been blown up, and before that they had blown up uh, our embassy and killed 32 Americans uh, in that shot. After the Beirut uh, bombing, the first truck bombing that we saw, 
uh, the, the rules of engagement were so ridiculous. Our men did not have, could not carry rifle clips, and they could not have a single round in the chamber, so that when they were run over by this truck that blew up the Marine barracks, they were, the, uh, the sentries were dead before, uh, before they could even lift, uh, even lift their rifles uh, to use them. Uh, but his reaction to it was to say, we will never give up, we will never, 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 we will fight them on the beaches, we will, etc." And then he, re he said, but I'm going to redeploy the troops, which he did to ships uh, in the Mediterranean, and we were out of there. Uh, I, although much of history has said that uh, we went into Grenada to cover uh, the embarrassment of Beirut, and that certainly is the way it worked out. But in fact, we were on our way to Grenada before uh, the soldiers were killed in Beirut. And in the, uh, this is very, this is the way Reagan operated and, and governed. Uh, he decided that we would, uh, we would go into, into Grenada on the, uh, to save, or so we said, uh, uh, American medical students there. Uh, and he sat through the briefings with the Joint Chiefs of Staff in which they said what they were going to do. And John Vesey, General Vesey, Army General, uh, who was then Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, they finished up the briefing, and Vesey and the rest of them knew that Reagan was barely listening. I mean, his eyes were glazed over and whatnot. But as they stood to go up, Reagan said to Vesey, how many men did you say you were going to send in there? And Vesey said 850. And Reagan said, double it. And Vesey said, why? And Reagan said, because if Carter had doubled the number of helicopters uh, in Desert One, you'd be briefing him and not me. Thank you. Now, <laughs> okay. Um, before we go to the story of my life, the jacket, um, the book is President Reagan, The Triumph of, the, of Imagination. Uh, Richard will sign the copies. Uh, Mark will be happy to uh, 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 sell you the book at a special reduced rate. Um, let him sign it, and then if you have some follow-up questions, we'll do that after uh, the other people have gone through. Now, here's the story about the jacket. Um, he grew up in Jersey City, like on the, uh, uh, New Jersey, and he was a fan of the Jersey City Giants who played in the International League at Roosevelt Stadium. And so, <clears throat> since we don't pay people to speak, I thought at a minimum we might give him a nice memento of tonight, and there it is. And it's authentic in every degree. Thank you, Dick okay. Reeves. Thank you. I would have done it. I would have done it for the jacket. I, uh, I am authentic. I grew up in Jersey City. Until I got to college, I thought America was an Italian country governed by the Irish. <laughs> <laughs> go to the, go to the, go to the. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. He'll be back there.